You know, we should have had. Oh. It's okay. Okay, so while people are joining us, I just want to say welcome to this event uh, hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute and uh, co-chaired by myself, the Namata Center for uh, Palestine Studies and uh, Nargis Farzat, uh, chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. And we've got Aki who is, you know, the lifesaver who does everything and the organization. So. He's, he's in the background helping everything move on. So this is going to be a special evening because it's uh, talking about uh, Moroccan cinema, which has always been exciting and uh, original and thought provoking in, from my perspective. And we have uh, three panelists here to talk about the recent uh, uh, collaboration in Morocco Uncut. And uh, so I will introduce them, uh, beginning with the lady, um, Florence Martin, who works on French transnational studies at uh, Goucher University in the United States. Welcome. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, William Hughes, who is Professor of Film Studies at Exeter University. And I've also got Jamal Balmand, who is a lecturer uh, at in, in cinema, I think, or in film, but correct me if I'm wrong, at uh, Muhammad V University in, in uh, Morocco, in Rabat. So welcome everything. The format today will be uh, a discussion or presentations from each of the uh, uh, panelists here. Um, that will take around half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour. And then we have, uh, we ask you to uh, put your questions in the question and answer uh, bubble at the, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will collect those questions and we will pose, pose those questions to uh, the authors. Uh, they're going to talk without uh, presentation, so uh, that will be quite interesting to uh, then think about uh, the questions that arise as, as they are talking. Without further ado, welcome to uh, to SOAS online and looking forward to hearing your uh, presentation. I don't know who wants to start, but it's up to you to decide. Okay, thank, thank you, Dina, that, that will be me. Um, so my name is Will Higby um, and um, together with uh, Jamal Bahmad and, and Flo Martin, we um, form part of a research team that's been looking quite intensively at um, the current state and the development of Moroccan cinema um, in all its many forms and guises um, over the past five years or so we've been working together. Um, what we wanted to do with this session was really to um, have a, a brief introduction from, from the three of us um, moving across some of the uh, what we think are the key questions and key approaches in relation to not only the research project but also the book and then open this up for discussion as much as possible. We're really Really delighted to be here um, and um, sort of uh, thank you very much for inviting us and, and we hope this is going to be a sort of a, an open and, um, and sort of a lively uh, discussion. So just to start with, um, perhaps I should say a few words about why we, we came to this project, you know, why focus on Moroccan cinema. So the project that led to um, the, the book Moroccan Cinema Uncut really began in around 2015. It was a um, research project that was supported by the AHRC for three years. Um, and um, the activities involved in um, the, uh, the research project were, were, were quite varied. So we had sort of the more sort of traditional research activities that were going on amongst the team but we were also very clear that this was a project that we wanted to engage with the Moroccan film industry with Moroccan filmmakers and with film educators and, and film students in in Morocco so there was very much a focus in this project on engaging with um, with the film industry with um, the CCM which is the National Screen Agency the Moroccan Film Council but also with filmmakers and with festivals and festival organizers because one of the things that we were particularly interested in was the fact that um, 
Moroccan cinema had had this sort of um, very um, impressive rise in the since the mid 1990s. Um, you know, for so long it had been overshadowed, I think, by the achievements and the output of Algerian Tunisian cinema, certainly in the sort of 70s, 80s, and early 90s. But from the mid 1990s to around um, 2015, um, there'd been a very significant rise in terms of production due to investment in. Um, in, in film production um, coming from the, from, from the state. Um, so moving from around two or three films a year in the late 1980s to, to 25 to 30 feature films in, in the mid 2010s, which placed Morocco as, according to some estimations, the fourth largest producer of films on the African continent. So this increase in production and a growing international recognition for a limited number of Moroccan art house directors was was, was coming to our attention, but at the same time, it, it, it was led with a with a sort of um, paradox that at the same time there as there were more films that were being produced, um, there was a question as to where these films were being seen. It was precisely a moment when distribution and exhibition, the infrastructure in Morocco, was in crisis, and there was really only a limited visibility internationally for for Moroccan cinema. So the aim of the book was to ask why this might be and to see if an analysis of Moroccan cinema and the Moroccan film industry could also act as a case study for other um, small nation cinemas, to use Duncan Petrie and Meta Hjort's term, in Africa, but also in the MENA region. And um, Flo's gonna pick up on this point in a moment, but we felt that the transnational approach was the right way to frame this analysis of the current state of Moroccan cinema. Um, firstly, because the transnational, we think allows us to explore the dynamic between the national and the transnational, the local and the global. Um, and to look at this as a, a kind of a dynamic, fluid, but also contested relationship. For example, sometimes the relationship between diasporic filmmakers and their counterparts in Morocco. Um, but we also wanted to use the transnational of a way of understanding this, the, the challenges and opportunities there were for these filmmakers, not only in producing films, but also in particularly in the way in which these films could circulate internationally through international film festivals and thinking of the opportunities and possibilities that were being offered increasingly by um, digital disruption and the online distribution of these films. So, so the book itself was divided into three parts, looking firstly at what we call production from above, which was essentially the established production hubs for Moroccan cinema, the well-established models of international co-production. Um, on the other hand, looking at in the second part at cinema from below, which was considering how there are also at the same time, Moroccan filmmakers who are working totally outside of that system um, and looking for ways in which their films can reach audiences in quite different ways. Um, but also thinking about in this idea of production from below, alternative means of film education um, that, 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 that are appearing, different ways in which um, emerging Moroccan filmmakers can get training and access to the means of production. And finally, the third part looks specifically at distribution networks. So not just audiences, internationally and nationally, um, but also festivals and the challenges, as I said, posed by digital disruption. And um, Flo's going to pick up now on this question of the theoretical grounding around transnationalism. Um, and then Jamal is going to talk a bit more about this idea of a multiplicity of voices. So I'll hand over to Flo, first of all. Thank you. Thank you, Will. My name is Flo Martin. I teach at Goucher College in the US. Um, so our approach was matched by an evolving context, obviously, from if you wish, uh, picture it as a widening circle that goes from the post-colonial to the post-post-colonial to the transnational, the globalized. So applying an exclusive post-colonial lens as, as we've done uh, in, previous, um, in previous things in the years 2010 is problematic for a, a Moroccan cinema because the enduring influence left by the French colonial rule on society, politics, cultural productions is much less vivid than it used to be in the 1970s or 80s. Um, the pioneers of the time, Wanani, Manuni, Beliazid, and so on, born under the colonial rule, had come back from training outside uh, the kingdom and shot documentaries for the CCM to support the independent nation and also to uh, 
uh, and also shot feature films that explored nationalistic struggles or at minimum denounced the colonial rule. But now we're dealing with filmmakers who were born after the colonial rule, and they are more likely to denounce the impact of neoliberal globalization on contemporary Moroccan society, rather than leading to economic disparities, migrations, and so on and so forth. So we're clearly at this point in a post-colonial post era. So what are we going to do? Even if France is still the major partner for transnational productions, we have observed a deorbiting um, uh, a move away from an excessive reliance on the axis, the old colonial axis, Morocco and uh, France, in both the filmic narratives and in the modes of production. The films are in Moroccan Darija rather than in French. They tackle Moroccan themes rather than French themes. And they, are, um, they no longer exclusively rely on the French funding planet, if you wish. So Moroccan producers have joined a much wider transnational network of funding centers outside of France, be they in Europe like Brussels, Amsterdam, or in the Arab world like Doha, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Um, and, it, and then today's uh, French influence appears in a much more muted, hybridized fashion within a larger context of globalized influences. So it is these global influences, both in terms of artistic production and financial production that we were interested in looking at. In that sense, today's Moroccan transnational cinema is decentered, um, free to engage in a circulation of people, of goods, of narratives, of languages, um, funding schemes across multiple borders, as opposed to what it used to be in, it used to do in, in the previous uh, incarnation of Moroccan cinema. It, it has also dissented at home. It no longer relies exclusively, uh, we show, on traditional national sites of production like the CCM or the Wanzazat Studios, but also on production hubs such as Casablanca and Tangier, which have become increasingly cosmopolitan due in part to the return of diasporic filmmakers to uh, Morocco or to what Will calls cinéastes de passage. Finally, the network of distribution is also decentered in several ways. In the age of post cinema, so we've had post, 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 and post again, uh, post cinema that we all know too well, especially right now that we are in a pandemic and look, we're not in the cinema happy uh, to view a movie on a large screen, but we are all sort of joining by a multiplicity of screens. Um, and on that, I will uh, give my mic to Jamal. Okay, thanks, Flo. So hello, everyone. My name is Jamal Bahmad. I teach at Mohammed V University in Rabat, Morocco. So there is a lot that is new about this book that is new in French. So, I mean, Flo and, and Will have mentioned the approach that you have taken, I mean, towards Moroccan cinema. But let me also look to, I mean, say a little bit about the material, what is included in the book in terms of content. So uh, there has been a lot of scholarship on Moroccan cinema before, of course, I mean, in different languages. So a lot of it in French, but a lot more in Arabic and published locally. Unfortunately, that doesn't get a lot of international visibility, but also there has been, I mean, a modest, I mean, some of uh, knowledge production about the cinema in English. Yet, I mean, the, this book is really, I mean, very inclusive. So when we start this project, we will just like three of us, and then Stephanie van der Peer, who was also a research fellow on the project, like myself, we started just interviewing everyone and talking to different people without really trying to come to any conclusions at all. So for the first two years, we're just really very open and very broad, and uh, we organized events as part of the project and brought in people together for the first time. And that resulted in a really a book that tries to look at Moroccan cinema in like a very inclusive way, hence the uncut, you know, in the title. Okay, to try to include, I mean, to really talk about Moroccan cinema in all its complexity and diversity. So for the first time in a book about Moroccan cinema, uh, there are sections about Amazigh cinema, so cinema in the Berber language, 
we we'll talk about its history, but also challenges that it, have, that it faced at the beginning in the 1990s when it first came into existence, but also challenges that it faced because of the digital disruption after 2000s. We talk also about a new kind of Moroccan filmmaking that it exists within the broad tent of Moroccan cinema. So we talk about radical filmmaking, experimental filmmaking. We talk about people like Nadir Bouhamouj, Hisham Asri, and then we talk also about you know places that have been like production hubs of Moroccan cinema, Moroccan international cinema that had been overlooked before, like Warzazat. But we don't talk also just about Warzazat as the place where films like Babel, you know, and other movies, Lawrence of Arabia, and so on were produced in the past. We talk about it as a place that also is home to a film school. So film schools are included in this book, and that's also something new, but it's also a new phenomenon in the country. But we talk about really how, you know, Moroccan film students are a new kind of demographic in the landscape of Moroccan cinema. And they are here in the age of digital disruption, and they are trying to make their voices heard in a cinema system that is not always, I mean, flexible enough. I mean, we'll talk about that, I mean, much later, I mean, today. So, I mean, transnational approach that uh, Will and, and uh, Flo have explained really allowed us to uh, take stock, but also to examine, you know, this, uh, all this diversity in a very multi-sided and truly genuinely interdisciplinary way. And both in Morocco and at home, because Moroccan cinema is not just Moroccan cinema in its like a national circulation, but also in its global circulation, and not only in like in the uh, in France, but also, I mean, all over the world, but really in the Middle East, in the Americas and so on. So, and we really hope, I mean, I think one plus of this book is that we hope that it would be the first step, okay, in a new kind of Moroccan, uh, in a new kind of scholarship about Moroccan cinema that would go beyond, I mean, the interpretive framework of national cinema, or like the analytical framework of Moroccan cinema being all about CCM, the Moroccan Cinema Center in Rabat, national film bureaucracy, and so on. Moroccan cinema is much more diverse than that, and it's becoming even more diverse and more complicated in the age of globalization. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Jamal. Um, before we, we opened it out to a broader discussion and maybe got to some of the questions in the Q&A, another thing we wanted to do was just we, we, each, pick, we, we each selected a, what we felt was a question that was an important question or theme that was running through the book itself. So we're just going to speak very briefly, each of us, about that. I'm going to start. My, the, one of the kind of driving questions for me was, how does or how can Moroccan cinema realize a, a transnational reach? Because we talked about um, earlier the, um, the difficulty for Moroccan cinema to reach an international audience. Actually, that difficulty starts domestically as well. Um, that despite this success in raising levels of production and the inward investment that is attracting um, foreign producers to come and shoot in Morocco, which we have to acknowledge benefits the foreign producers far more than it does the local filmmakers, um, we, we were trying to think about how, how what, what steps could be put in place and working with industry and working with filmmakers to better understand how they could reach an, a, a, a transnational audience. Um, so, one of the things that we focused on in the book in particular was the importance of um, international co-production, both in what you might call official, bilateral, multilateral treaty agreements between different nation states, but also unofficial. So the work that goes on, for example, outside of the, the official channels and collaboration between filmmakers. We One of the things we noticed as well was that, that there's there used to be very much a kind of um, emphasis on the post-colonial access between access between France and Morocco. And although it's still true that the largest number of co-productions that, that, that take place are between France and Morocco, actually just focusing on that relationship solely and thinking in terms of a post-colonial cinema belies the kind of impact and development of international co-production activity that's going on um, in, in South America with Argentina, for example, um, in with an increasing number of um, European nations, um, 
but also in relation to the Gulf states. Um, and we're thinking here not only about co-production, but also the money that's being invested through film festivals and film funds in relation to development and, um, and post-production. So understanding how Moroccan filmmakers can, can navigate that, that international landscape of film funds, co-production and film markets was, was a key question that was running through the, um, the book for us. Um, and there's also an issue of, of how that links into the international festival network, because um, the international festival network operates, you know, of, of major A-list international film festivals, but also of smaller niche boutique festivals, film festivals that operate within a national context, is really important for Moroccan filmmakers in the sense that it functions as a kind of alternative distribution network. For, for, the, for the filmmakers to, to have their films reach international audiences, but also that festival network is important in terms of the networking function that it offers for um, in terms of the industry, to build professional relationships, to look for um, co-producing partners, to also gain an advantage of through transnational talent development, as we call it in relation to um, better kind of accessing training labs um, and development initiatives and schemes and so forth for, for Moroccan filmmakers. Now, this is um, something that we were very keen to emphasize in the study, but it's also something that is incredibly challenging. And one of the things that we found is there was often a disparity and, and, a, and a disconnect between a small elite of filmmakers often located in the diaspora who were more um, attuned to those opportunities internationally, better equipped to network and to travel um, internationally to those festivals and markets and whose films travel better on the international um, festival network. So there's still, I think, work to be done in terms of um, allowing a greater range of Moroccan um, cinema in its true diversity to, to reach international audiences and to find those audiences, which kind of brings me on to, to the, the, the final point that I wanted to, to note there, which is just the way in which digital disruption has changed that landscape in terms of access. On the one hand, we can see that Moroccan films can travel virtually as never before. They can find audiences, they can be seen on platforms. And we did notice in the research we did that there were sort of examples of that, that success happening. Um, but equally, that issue of access, even in a digital age and in, in relation to, to sort of online viewing still remains. The question of who are the gatekeepers, how films access and reach their audiences is a, is a really important one. And we can maybe elaborate on that a bit later in terms of the challenges that Moroccan cinema finds in terms of accessing those um, digital online um, distribution networks to reach its audiences. But I just want to finish just, just to stop there and then hand over to Flo, who's gonna say um, a bit more. Thanks, Will. So, my question <clears throat> that I'm going to talk about today is how does Moroccan cinema accommodate diverse voices or even perhaps flip it and say, how do diverse voices find a way into Moroccan transnational cinema in the years 2010? Um, and so to be brief, I'll mention three marginalized groups, uh, the Jewish community, the Amazigh community and, and women. Um, and I will probably lean more on women. Amazigh cinema, as Jamal told you earlier, developed in the 1990s in what, was be, what became a Susi wood, just like Nollywood and Bollywood, from the region of Sousse, a cinema on VHS that was easy to um, ship to the remote villages and also to the diaspora. Um, and it was not necessarily uh, supported by the state given its nationalistic cultural um, impulses. So starting in the years 2000, though, Amazigh diasporic filmmakers become uh, professional uh, filmmakers. And we see Yasmani, uh, Yasmin Ksari uh, direct uh, The Sleeping Child, for instance, the first film with extensive uh, dialogues in Damazigh, and Mohammed Amin Ben Amrawi, uh, film uh, Adios Carmen, uh, shot in the riff entirely in Tarifit in Spanish. So both transnational uh, productions, and that's important, they were this time funded by um, Doha, Belgium, all sorts of other uh, places outside of Morocco, 
these transnational uh, productions tour the international festivals and gain some uh, international visibility. Um, the rise of Amazir film is, is then confirmed at home by uh, Kamal Ashkar's Tirir Jerusalem, uh, Echoes of the Melah, which um, is a fascinating documentary on the shared histories of the Jewish community and the Amazigh community. Um, and then his latest incarnation, one might say, we, we found, was by uh, people like Tala Hadid, a woman of, uh, director of uh, Moroccan and Iraqi descent, who directed The Narrow Frame of Midnight, a transnational co-production uh, with a transnational uh, narrative actually that moves between Morocco, Kurdistan, um, Turkey, Iraq. Uh, and she played with a variety of transnational centers in order to produce her film. She got funding from the CCM in, in, in Morocco, the British Institute, Doha, Sundance, Fonds Sud, uh, the Alwan Foundation. And which is exactly what Moroccan women do, uh, we argue. They in the years 2000, their, their numbers has, has grown from four in the 1980, in, 19, in the 1980s to over 20. Um, and, and that's in part due to the digital revolution, but um, they in the years 2010 um, uh, have two distinctive creative strategies in order to produce. One is to negotiate with the establishment and the other one is to circumvent it uh, and go from one to the other. So in the first instance, women directors become very savvy in, in negotiating within and outside the socio-cultural political landscape of Morocco and its institutions like the M, uh, the, the TV channel or the CCM, both in the way they finance their uh, films transnationally and in the representational strategies they adopt to address um, taboos. Women no longer systematically resort to uh, coded language, for instance, uh, to talk about themselves or, or about sex. Um, they also respond to what is going on in Morocco, in the, the king, um, and, it, and it's, it, it's very difficult for us, I think, to actually, I just need to say, to put it out there, to talk about Morocco without talking about the larger context of Morocco, uh, historical and, and, and political, which is what we do in the book, so, so you know, so it's completely contextualized. Um, so they respond to what's going on, would be it the Mudawana, the new family code in 2004, or the Me Too movement, uh, which is more global, as you know. Um, for instance, in our, and, and, and they, they, answer, they, they also respond to political um, uh, initiatives such as the, um, the Equity and Reconciliation Commission that Mohammed the, the VI uh, put on uh, in order to um, examine uh, the, um, the years of lead. So th this is a whole, anyway. And um, much like Hadid's, Kilani's transnational production assembled funds from institution in, for her film, Our Forbidden Places in 2008, from institutions uh, including the CCM, the Equity and Reconciliation Commission in Morocco, the CNC and Fonds Sud in France, uh, and also um, won multiple awards for her film. Yasmani Kassari also films beyond in her fiction film, The Sleeping Child, about the women left behind by uh, their husbands who are migrating to Europe. Um, her focus is on a triply marginalized community, Amazigh, rural and female. And that triple uh, marginalized community element makes the narrative all the more powerful. And again, this super local uh, uh, focus is a transnational uh, production. Transnational film directors also respond to uh, the Mudawana, the New Family Code, with films of various genres. There is a comedy, uh, number one by Tahiri. There is a rom-com, Maroc, by Leila Marakshi. 
a documentary, I Have Something to Tell You by Dali Laenad. And the, la the latter is interesting to me because it is also a way of filming beyond the um, event of the Mudawana by seeing how women, how do you uh, communicate that law to women, to poor rural women, or women in factories who do not know what their rights are. Um, and so she, she shows what a long road there is still to go, um, no, the long road ahead to achieve equal rights. So even though Enad produced her film with the help of transnational institutions like 2M, NMO, CMC, French TVs, her film does not completely uh, celebrate the Mudawana in some ways. They also find ways, as I said, to circumvent the establishment. Um, and find new hubs of transnational production. And this is interesting. There are two main ways that we um, identified. One is filmmakers turned installation artists who uh, use funds from museums and foundations to produce either their films as um, Farida Ben Yazid is doing. She is doing a series of uh, short 26 minute long uh, documentaries on Amazigh music and dance, uh, paid for by the, by the uh, Leila uh, Mezian, Benjeloud Mezian Foundation, which will be hosted in a music on the multiple cultures of Morocco in Casablanca. And of course, all this didn't happen in a void, by the way, in a vacuum. Mohammed VI did declare that there were multiple cultures in Morocco, as opposed to the old myth of one Arab, Muslim, Moroccan identity. And then the second one would be uh, Bushra Khalili, who in her activist uh, video art, straight stories on clandestine passages at uh, both the Strait of Gibraltar and the one in Istanbul, um, is actually using international funds and um, is exhibited at the MoMA in New York, at the Tuileries in Paris, and so on. Um, Finally, Sonia Terrab, which is in an, an interesting uh, experiment, turned to something called Jaojab, an online ca uh, talent incubator supported by Nabil Ayush. And she produced Marokiat, a series of one minute long capsules, which she now is distributing on Facebook, which are visible on Facebook. And these are in answer to the Me Too movement. And this Me Too, the capsules um, show each woman filmed frontally um, from various walks of life, various age groups, and each woman is outside sort of reoccupying the public space uh, or occupying the public space. And, um, and I think this is quite a radical move. It's shifting productions on film, on um, shifting production and film viewing from physical locations to virtual ones with an online curating space means that you can dodge the control of the state yet never be clandestine because Nabil Ayush, who is supporting this, is one of the biggest producers in Casablanca, part of the establishment. So to skirt around the establishment is not to hide from it, but to maintain a transvergent relationship with it to converge with it at times, to diverge from it at others. Um, and the question, however, remains, which is the same question that uh, Will posed, who will see these films apart from the you know, capsules on Facebook? How visible is this new cinema both within and outside the kingdom? And Jamal, it's yours to respond. Like, what is the audience for Moroccan cinema today? Who are the people, I mean, watching these movies? And uh, also, like, when filmmakers make these movies, who are they making these films, I mean, for? So the question of the audience is really a very critical one. But, uh, I mean, that, I want to link that question of the audience to really, I mean, something that has not been going well for Moroccan cinema. So in terms of production numbers, in terms of international visibility, Moroccan cinema has gained a lot and has gained a lot of momentum, I mean, in the la over the last two decades. Yet at home, uh, cinema, the number of cinema theaters, I mean, has gone down. So the, from about 300 cinemas in the early 80s 
there are less than 30 cinemas left today, okay? So that is a big, I mean, challenge for Moroccan cinema because a lot of films are being made, okay? For example, uh, 20 to 25 feature land fiction movies and documentaries every year. That's quite a lot on the African continent, a lot more short documentaries. So the Moroccan government through the National Cinema Center, CCM, is supporting a lot of productions, yet distributing and getting these, you know, movies to be watched, you know, by Moroccans, I mean, beyond, you know, the circuit, the festival circuit, is a big challenge. Because the cinemas that, uh, even the small number of cinemas that are left, are mostly in big cities like uh, Casablanca, Rabat, and then Tangier and Marrakesh. So Moroccan cinema is not really, I mean, reaching its, like, uh, audience using traditional channels of distribution and exhibition. Okay, I'll come back to this point because uh, digital, I mean, disruption, and I think it's responsible for what's been happening because it's not happening only in Morocco, it's happening also, I mean, all over the continent or the African continent. So less people, especially less young people are going to the, to the movies, are going to the cinema to watch films. So the number of film going numbers are really, I mean, are going down. So even when we talk about Moroccan cinema, Moroccan films, top in the box office, okay, which is a kind of unique situation to Morocco since 1990s. So when there is a good Moroccan film out there, Moroccans go to the cinema, they watch it more than they watch, you know, like Hollywood productions and so on. Yet uh, the problem is that um, the, the number of uh, film, I mean, number of theaters is going down, but also piracy is here. So film piracy is, is a big problem, okay? It is affecting, you know, uh, all sorts of films in the country. So if you go to, I mean, Moroccan city now, like, well, before the pandemic, of course, then you'd find, you know, I mean, like, that you can buy international movies and uh, Moroccan movies as well, for as little as four or five dirhams, 10 dirhams and so on. So the, uh, I mean, for a small, like, cinema, like Moroccan cinema, to have a piracy as a fact, Okay, as an everyday, I mean, a reality out there is really a big problem. But of course, uh, a lot of Moroccan film institutions, they have blamed pirates really for contributing to the shrinking number of cinemas in the country. I don't think that uh, that is true. And in this book, we argue that, I mean, this uh, film piracy does not always affect, you know, Moroccan films badly, because if you take examples of Casa Negra by you know, Nordil Khmari, Okay, which was a box office hit in 2008. It was released in cinemas, but at the same time, it was, it was available in the black market as a, a DVD, but also digital copies were available on the internet at the time. Still, the film did very, very well in cinemas. And although, you know, it was pirated really from day one. Okay, so, but a lot of movies that have not uh, been pirated were released in cinemas and they didn't do very well. So saying that piracy leads, okay, directly, I mean, to really to less people going to the cinema to watch Moroccan movies is not, I mean, is not always, I mean, true. But yet, I mean, piracy is here, but we see it rather as a, as a phenomenon, as a cultural phenomenon that just shows that, you know, lots of things are happening uh, to distribution and exhibition of Moroccan movies. So more and more young people in particular I mean, I'm watching these movies online, talking about them. And I teach cinema to my students at the university in Rabat. And every year I run a research seminar on that. And the really the level of interest in Moroccan cinema seems to be going up among young people. They know so much about it. But when you ask them how, how many times do you go to the cinema, very, very few of them, I mean, really go to the cinema. And even when they go there, they go to watch international productions sometimes because they are blockbusters, everybody is talking about them. But the Moroccan movies, they seem to be consuming more of them, I mean, online. And uh, because again, they are pirated, they are available. But also they, I mean, uh, during lockdown, I mean, when the, this crisis, I mean, started, I mean, in March in Morocco, the country, the, like everywhere around the world, imposed the lockdown on its people. And then CCM, okay? Surprisingly, maybe, I mean, this uh, kind of, um, uh, film board of the, of the country, which has often, I mean, given this image as being very rigid, being very bureaucratic, being against, you know, digi digitization of distribution and exhibition, launched a program of online screenings, 
Okay, so they, they screened a lot of Moroccan movies, and that really led to a lot more interest in Moroccan cinema among, you know, the, among the population, but especially among, the, among, among the young people. But still, I mean, the, the, the screening program of CCM stopped in November. Now, the, 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 the movies that are made every year, uh, many of them get, you know, some, uh, I mean, go to the festivals, national and international. Some are released in cinemas, but a lot really, I mean, don't get, you know, to be watched by the Moroccan, by the Moroccan audience. So that is a big problem, and I think the film authorities need to do something about it. So really, they need to catch up with digital, I mean, revolution. They need to, I mean, uh, re digitize some of these processes so that people, I mean, can go all with, I mean, uh, can go to the cinema to watch movies, but at the same time, people, especially in cities, like even Wazazat, which is cinema city of Morocco, you don't have, we don't have any cinemas. There used to be two, but they closed down a long time ago. So in a city that makes a lot of uh, international productions, but also national ones, you don't have access, you know, to, I mean, to cinema, to the movies, I mean, to watch. So, I mean, they need to really, I mean, to be more flexible. They need to um, create a digital infrastructure, I mean, for distribution and exhibition to allow, you know, for people to watch, not just movies made, I mean, like this year and next year, but also the old classics of Moroccan cinema, because some of the gems of Moroccan cinema were made in the 70s and 80s. And unfortunately for young people today, they are beyond reach. And a lot of people don't really know that, you know, there was a Moroccan cinema in 60s and 70s and the following decade. So that is, I mean, something that uh, uh, the, the Moroccan, I mean, cinema center needs uh, to think about, but also something else that has been really, uh, uh, and I want, this is my last point, uh, something that has uh, really been bothering a lot of, uh, especially young filmmakers, is the permit system. I mean, the permit system, I mean, if you want to shoot a movie in Morocco, you need the permission of the, the Moroccan Cinema Center, which is, I mean, funding, I mean, it provides a lot of funds for filmmakers, but at the same time, it's a censorship board. So uh, people like Nadir Bohamush, and there is a section about him, so he's a radical uh, filmmaker in Morocco, and he, I mean, makes films underground because he can't simply get permission to shoot the kinds of movies that he, that he, that he makes. So that is a big problem. Also for a young Moroccan filmmaker to get established today, it's very difficult because the conditions that are imposed by CCM, like you should make three short movies, three short, I mean, uh, films before you apply for funding. But even when you apply for funding, you do that production company to back your project and so on. It's very, very difficult, I mean, for, I mean, for young filmmakers. So yeah, there are so many challenges out there, so many problems. And I hope that in future they will be resolved so that Moroccan cinema is not only made, but also consumed and especially consumed by, you know, uh, by the national audience as well. Thank you. So, well, yeah. hi. So thank, thank you very much. Do you want to come back, William, or? Uh, no, no, I was just going to say that we're, we're now, we, we, we can move into the, onto the questions that are in the in the Q&A and I, I don't know how you want to, to work through those or? All right, I, I've got a question myself which I, which I can ask very briefly and I'm going to ask Nargis to come in and help because my internet went off and I've lost and I had to go out and come back yeah. in. Uh, so I have, uh, I have, oh no, I've got some questions now, uh, but I've lost a few questions at the top. Um, but it's a quick question, really, which is you talk about, you know, kind of the transnational, um, uh, the transnational as kind of the, the, the conceptual framework as being there. So how does it relate to the national, particularly that in the case of the national, in, your, in, in this case, you've got... Um, you've got a complex mixture of groups and languages and ethnicities and so on. So how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you deal with that as a kind of, uh, uh, let us say, a, 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 found, you know, a conceptual framework? Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask. And then I think we just go to the questions. It's, it's an open question uh, in, in many ways. Should, do you want me to, to begin with and then Flo and um, Jamal can? Yeah, 
whatever yeah. yeah, I think the, 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 the transnational as a, as a sort of theoretical framework or an analytical framework, the way in which we've come at that is, is through the, the way in, largely in which film studies and film theory has, has engaged with the transnational. Um, and, and the way in which that draws also on, um, you know, writing from sociology and other, other disciplines, it's a sort of interdisciplinary approach, but very much at the heart of that, I think, is a sense that um, film has from its inception been a transnational medium, you know, it's, it, and, and films cross borders and boundaries. International co-production is very much a common part of, of, of um, how films are financed and made. But, but very interestingly, you know, there, there has been a strong development of an idea of national cinema, you know, national screen agencies are incredibly important in terms of promoting um, the, the supposed interests of a, often a particular vision of what a national cinema should be. What we're interested in in using the transnational as, as a sort of as a, as a framework and something that's been written about quite a lot in relate in film studies is is that the the dialogue that there is between the national and the and the transnational the idea that the um that the, the national doesn't disappear when we think about about we think about cinema transnationally it's about that dynamic between the two and often the tension that exists between the two and i think that the an example of of the, the place of diasporic filmmakers in morocco is a really really interesting one there and it illustrates that quite well you know in the mid 1990s one of the things that the that the ccm the moroccan film council did to try and um sort of kickstart um, a greater international visibility for films and um, to, to increase the quality and the, and, the, and the range of films being made was to encourage Moroccans from the diaspora to return and, and make films with, with money coming from, um, from the Moroccan Film Council. Um, that in itself did provide a sort of, um, Hicham Lassri talks about it as an electric shock that sort of revitalized Moroccan cinema. Um, and those perspectives are really valuable in terms of the sort of and the and, and the visibility of those filmmakers like Nabi Layush, for example. Um, but at the same time, that has caused some resentment amongst certain Moroccan filmmakers who are very much based within Morocco and working within Morocco and not looking for international funds, who feel that those filmmakers are kind of taking away from the opportunities that they have. And in some ways, you know, we, we've, we've conducted interviews with some filmmakers who say, well, you know, it's kind of... Uh, that they're Moroccan filmmakers, but they have a sort of, you know, a, more of a, a European perspective, say, on, on, on the kind of issues that we're looking at. So there's a tension there between, a, you know, an idea of a transnational Moroccan cinema and a national. So it's, it's thinking about how those two things work together and also how, for example, you know, and Jamal can speak about this much more and, you know, more eloquently and more knowledgeably because this is one of his kind of particular areas that he's, he's worked on. But the idea that Amazir cinema, which, you know, for a long time was ignored as part of a Moroccan national cinema, has a transnational reach through its distribution online, through the circulation of DVDs and, and the kind of the, the films reaching a diasporic audience. And, and reaching a kind of displaced audience within Morocco uh, of, of, of Amazir people who have kind of moved to say larger cities outside of their kind of their home region, but also transnationally, you know, a, a kind of connection with a diasporic audience. So there's a really interesting interplay there again between the local and the global. And I think the, the final thing I'd say there as well is that the transnational, um, I think is a kind of, it, it, it's a more accommodating way of thinking ar about that that dynamic and and those those that that flow between you know between the global and the local and simply thinking in terms of globalization, um, because I think it kind of is more attuned to the the dynamics of power as well that that, that are at play. So that's I don't know. Do you want to add anything to that, Jamal or Flo? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Moroccan, I mean, cinema, I mean, in Tamazi, I mean, the Amazon, what you call Amazon cinema. I mean, it was born in the early 1990s and it was born in Algeria at the same time. But like from production to exhibition, I mean, it was really like post-national in a way. I mean, post-national in terms of sense, um, in terms of uh, the fact that, you know, at that time it was not, I mean, allowed, like it was not, I mean, like Moroccan Cinema Center, but also the government, but also just, you know, the regime, you know, uh, as such, you know, they, they had repressed, you know, Amazigh identity and Amazigh cultural production for so long. So when those movies were being made, like the first ones were made almost underground. And then, you know, the, the, where the money was coming from, but also like when you look at the movies, 
uh, themselves, like the first movie, I mean, the Tumblr of the World of the Golden Woman, really starts with a scene where, you know, the, I mean, the protagonist of the movie, you know, is arriving in his village in southwest in Sousse, and he's coming back, you know, from France. So like that journey, really, like from the, the global to the local, and then from the local to the global, is very dear in terms of thematics, you know, of the of these movies, but also it's uh, production like uh, networks, it's exhibition networks. They were really very diverse and they were really, I mean, uh, cross-cutting between Morocco and France, between the like uh, Moroccan, you know, Moroccan Imazir and the Moroccan Berber community, but also the, I mean, the Amazir, I mean, diaspora in Europe and elsewhere. So national cinema framework really cannot, I mean, is not adequate, I mean, to understand, uh, I mean, Amazir cinema. You know, both in terms of uh, textual, I mean, play in the movies, like as text, but also in terms just of the production and exhibition, I mean, uh, uh, environment. Thank you. Maybe, yes. Um, May I add one more thing? If, if you look at um, the, the, um, the team that goes with a movie these days, uh, it's even more so, more, more the case. Uh, uh, I think uh, Alios Carmen had a star from um, Argentina, is it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Argentina, uh, okay, all sorts of funding from elsewhere, but Argentina, the music was mixed uh, in New York. I mean, it just goes all over the map. And how then do you qualify such a movie that exceeds its borders? constantly in this in this place and it's a play between the local and the global thank you that's great so i'm inviting nargis to ask the first 14 questions and uh and then we can uh, and then i can take the ones coming up for that thing yes i was looking for uh, a question from marla hammond who teaches cinema that she says that um uh uh, she's a big fan of Fauzi bin Saidi's and love to teach his film A Thousand Months. And this is partly due to the way he theorizes his own filmmaking practices in interesting and accessible ways. And um, thinking about constructions of a powerful gaze, could you point Marla towards other directors who theorize their practices so clearly? Uh, in her studies of Arabic literature, she thinks of Morocco as a powerhouse house of Arabic literary theory. So does this extend to uh, cinema as well? Hmm. Any, any one of you speakers would like to comment? Yes. I think that uh, Moroccan, I mean, cinema in recent years has provided a lot of opportunities for filmmakers from the region to come because of the number of festivals that are, I mean, exist in the country. So more than 50 festivals, a lot of them supported by the Moroccan Cinema Center. And also in terms of innovation, I mean, like filmmakers like Hisham Al-Azri, he's, he's a bit like a Fawzi bin Sandi. Yeah. Yes. He makes film, but also he's like experimenting and theorizing his practice as he makes those movies. So his movies, I mean, are very fun to watch, but also, I mean, they are very raw and they invite a lot like the, the old, like, spectator to, I mean, to be very, very alert, okay, but also really to start thinking about, you know, the film itself, you know, as a you know, kind of, uh, I mean, new way. So it's not like they are not finished products that you just watch, you know, for the story or whatever. They are also, I mean, a very reflexive, I mean, kinds of uh, pieces I mean, of work. So yeah, I don't think that Morocco is the center of film theory, like in the sense that it's center of literary theory at the moment. But there is film criticism is uh, is happening here. So there is a lot of, I mean, healthy levels of uh, production in terms of books and articles published by local scholars on Moroccan cinema. Lots of uh, conferences are organized, but I wouldn't claim that it's like the hub of film criticism. The powerhouse of the, yes. I think uh, I'd, I'd, I'd probably add to that that um, if you get the chance and if you enjoyed Ben Saidi's earlier work, try and get to see Volubilis, his um, most recent film, because it's it's absolutely fantastic. It was um, it was it was released a couple of years ago and and scooped most of the prizes at the National Festival in Tangier. But it's a really fantastic film in terms of very you know 
we consider it to be very transnational in terms of the way in which it plays with cinematic references from, um, you know, popular um, Egyptian cinema to, um, to, to Hitchcock and but places them in a very kind of local um, context in terms of its engagement with Moroccan politics and kind of issues facing a younger generation. So if you can, if you can find a copy of that film, I'd, I'd really- Name, name the film again, please. We, we can supply a list of kind of recommended yes. films. Yeah, yes, but actually there have been some questions saying that could mm. you, there are some yeah. obviously amongst the audience who are new to the topic, yeah. that and almost, you know, three or four that you recommend yeah. people and, start with. And another important, I think in terms of sort of um, filmmaking as, um, as kind of um, a, an investigation of Morocco's film history, I think the films of Ali Asafi are really important as well in terms of, and, and again, we can provide some examples there. He, he's been very instrumental in sort of re um, kind of valorizing the importance of early experimental um, documentary filmmaking in Morocco, of, of um, rediscovering and, um, and, and renovating, you know, re restoring those films. He's also, he also his films are kind of, um, are an exploration of, of not only of, of those important documentary films, but also a kind of question of what is Moroccan cinema. So again, we could put some recommend oh, recommendations to Ali's work as well. Very good, yeah. And the language, some people ask about the language of is it, is it Arabic, French, what other languages uh, that are? Well, it's, it, it's in Darija now, which is the, the Moroccan dialect, or it is in one of the three variants of Tamazight, right? Tamazight, yeah, yeah, which are there questions about that, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Amin uh, Ben Amrawi said that he he had it um, subtitled in French but not in Arabic, uh, and he said people understood. And there is, you know, he said he claims that he is building on the old, very old this time uh, films of his childhood, which which were Hindi films. Uh, in Hindi, not necessarily always dubbed or subtitled, and that everybody, and that this is in the film, I mean, this is also one of the films, by the way, Adios Carmen, that I would completely recommend, and that is um, within reach, I believe, in the US, for instance, and, and in Europe. Um, and and it, it, he talks about the fact that it becomes a celebration that you don't need language in some ways. It's very, it's fascinating. Uh yeah. Now Your mic is off, Marcus. Yes. You're mute. Okay. So I'm so sorry. Yes, I was going to say, like the Indian cinema of old in Middle East, and I mean, it didn't matter. That nobody yeah. even really paused to think it was in Hindi. It didn't matter. So you would love this film, Nargis, because uh, you will see the whole audience dancing with the people on screen, and you know, and singing, even though they don't understand what they sing. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so there are a few questions which you have asked Nargis and you have answered, which in relation to the language, um, what language the films are in, and lots of questions around Amazigh uh, films, which I think Jamal has answered in his talk. But there's an uh, interesting question around um, the, uh, for example, if can you talk about some of the challenges facing Amazigh cinema in the age of globalization and maybe even before? And then in relation to that uh, is, uh, yeah, so it, because you talked about digital disruptions, you used that term, so perhaps you could, uh, you could explore that a bit more. And then we'll come, and then, every, you know, there is a question there about social media and film streaming networks like Netflix and FilmNow. Do they constitute a challenge? So do you consider these big behemoths of, uh, you know, film production as being uh, some, you know, uh, examples of disruptions? Uh, and then we go to other questions. Thank you. Where do you think? Yeah, well, go ahead. Well, do you want to? Talk and about I was going to say, do you, want, do you want to start with the, the, the first question? I think was more about the challenges for what I'm yeah. using. Yeah, it's facing a lot of challenges. So basically, it started as a video cinema in 1990s. It was not funded by the government like the rest of Moroccan cinema. So uh, therefore, you know, films were made on very small budgets, and they were, I mean, distributed locally in Agadir and the region initially, but also in diaspora in France. 
But then, you know, cinema really started to get a little bit more professional. So the, there were more productions, but also there was even a star system for this kind of uh, vernacular cinema. And then in the early 2000s, what happened is that, you know, piracy, I mean, almost killed the cinema. So because, you know, the cinema relied on returns on copies of films sold so that, you know, the, the production company would make more movies and so on. So in lack, with the absence of any help from any, like uh, from the government, it was difficult for the production companies to survive in the early 2000s. So most of them really, I mean, just, you know, shut shop. So they closed shop because they could not, I mean, survive. So films, as soon as they were made, they would be in the markets, they would be like everywhere. But then one person would buy a scene, I mean, like the original copy, pay the authentic copy, and then they would make lots of copies, you know, for friends and for people. And then you would also find these movies being sold everywhere in the country. So the production model simply, I mean, uh, um, was disrupted by piracy in the early 2000s. Then in 2009, there was uh, this new development in Morocco. So the, the country, I mean, had been like, like since to 2001 with the Ajdir, you know, I mean, speech of the king, where he said, you know, that Tamazir and Amazir identity uh, are the backbone, you know, of national identity in Morocco. And then we need the really to teach language, we need to incorporate it into the media and so on. So a TV channel, okay, Tamazir TV channel, was established in, in late 2009, and it has been helping, I mean, some of these uh, film actors and filmmakers to make movies because as a TV channel, it has a budget, and then they are making a lot of the movies for, I mean, for, uh, for, this TV, uh, for the television. Now, more recently, what's been happening is that a lot of films are made and distributed only on YouTube, okay? So a lot of these production companies, now they rely on uh, returns like uh, ad returns, like advertising on YouTube, in order to survive and make more movies. So that is that has been a really, I mean, kind of like the latest development in terms of Amazigh cinema and the way it is trying to survive in the age of digital disruption. Yes, that's true. And what about funding? There are a couple of questions about government funding. Is that something that is? Um, openly available or, or just comes with conditions? Well, you, you, you write a, a scenario. Yes, the, it is. The CCM has a commission that looks at scripts, um, evaluates the scripts, and then attributes funding or not. And then um, during the development, there are three or four tranches, je me souviens plus, three? I oh, think. usually, yeah. Oh, yeah, for, and then you get the money as you provide evidence that you're doing what you said you were doing. Um, and uh, basically the CCM is a co-producer of most Moroccan films um, as a result of that. And and Jamal mentioned before, um, Nadir Boumou, she was a, a, yes. a filmmaker who works entirely outside of the system for precisely those reasons, because he, I mean, inevitably within that context, there's also an element, I think, of um, self-censorship amongst, you know, certain filmmakers. There are kind of top certain topics that they know and red lines that they know they, they, that, that, that they shouldn't cross because they just won't get the films kind of um, approved and, and receive the funding from the SAM. So Nadir is someone who sort of very clearly placed himself outside of that because he didn't want to compromise the, you know, the politics of his, of his films um, and was someone who used the digital tools at his disposal. So he went direct to YouTube and Vimeo. He subtitled his, um, his films, um, his first film, My Max and Me, um, he subtitled to that in in in, um, in English um, and distributed that online, and you know was capturing tens of thousands of of, of, of views. You know more than any Moroccan uh, documentary filmmaker could hope to get if they were sort of trying to go through um, you know theatrical release, and and to the point where his most recent film. Um, Amasu, which again is another film that I'd really, really recommend if you can get to see it, you, should, you, you see that film. Um, 
where he whereby um at the national festival just before the the, the pandemic caused the lockdown in morocco as well there was a whole question as to whether the film was going to be even be allowed to be screened at the national festival um and in the end there was a there was a kind of sense that the, the, the film was the film was allowed to be screened um in part because a kind of calculation was made by 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 the CCM and by and by the state that there would be more sort of negative a more negative impact if that film wasn't allowed to be screened. But I think Nadir is an example of someone who's really sort of like he who is who has looked for alternative distribution networks to not compromise his politics and actually um, you know it, it has been able to find a space and find an audience. And that was precisely one of the things in researching the book that we were interested in. Where are those alternative spaces you know and how to feel how do filmmakers reach their audience um because the possibilities are there in a way like never before but but th that doesn't mean that you can reach that audience you can find that audience because um it's also about the audience knowing that that film is is there right and i think that comes back to something you were asking about about kind of the major streamers the netflixes and so forth um yeah. i mean the, the point the point there is that those those are um, you know Morocco is not alone in trying to trying to work out how it navigates that kind of relate negotiates that relationship with with the, the new online majors like like Netflix for example. Um, I think that you know there was a company called IC Flicks who wanted to kind of build themselves as the Netflix of the Arab world who seemed like they were going to be investing in Moroccan productions and this was going to be an alternative that really kind of crashed and burned and certain Moroccan filmmakers had a bad experience in terms of what they felt was being guaranteed to them in terms of production and distribution. I think that the, 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 the reality of Netflix as in many other countries is that they will you know they are the kind of global dominant kind of superpower of streaming they yeah. will come in and try and capture an audience but That's one of one of the difficulties they have is that that, that their sort of first is, is their kind of pricing model because the kind of pricing model that they have excludes a large part of the Moroccan audience who are not going to be able to afford that subscription and who perhaps are looking for content that Netflix doesn't actually offer you know this is the kind of classic experience of of um you know, the sort of so-called Nollywood model, the entrepreneurial model that is entirely driven by kind of looking for its audience and in which it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it finds itself outside of that dynamic. But, but yeah, I think there's, there, there are issues around, um, you know, again, who exactly. the, gatekeep the gatekeepers are still there and it's yes, how yeah. these things can reach their audience. Yes, because we have big market, I mean, YouTube, I think, probably needs to step in and are probably more accessible, you know, buying the films I, from that. Anyway, may, need to may, I, may I add something? Uh, yeah, of uh, course. Lamia Shraibi, who is one of those amazing transnational uh, producers who is in Casablanca uh, and has two, uh, two companies, one in Casablanca, one in Paris, um, is right now co-producing with somebody in Beirut, in um, Cairo, and I don't remember where else, a He's co-producing a series that is going to be made for TV, very much on the on the on the on the Netflix model or the Amazon Prime model for Hisham Lasri, who is going to do something he's never done before, which is a series with a, a mixture of genres. There'll be somebody. It's the story of someone who crosses the 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 try to immigrate, you know, via sea, and then um, ends up being. Uh, haunted by seven dead people who died during the voyage. And so you can imagine it goes all over the, the place. But I find that very interesting that, and that Lamia Shraibi is saying, okay, so we don't have Netflix right now, but let's see what the um, Arab world can do. And she is actually now more and more interested in having a sort of pan-Arab or pan-African system of uh, co-production. That's very interesting. There is a question here which I think is quite interesting because it relates to this idea of transnationalism. And the question is whether uh, transnationalism brings about a certain disconnect between Moroccan uh, art, including cinema production, and between, um, between the locals, between um, and the local cultures and norms and the Moroccan public. Could the move from VHS to be sent in to, to local villages 
to online exhibition and transnational collaboration have brought about the de deterioration of the groundedness of Moroccan cinema and contributed to its disconnect. Uh, so it might be interesting to, uh, to kind of respond to this question. And again, the question also, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the person who's asking is, want, wants to know about the political context. How does that affect uh, what is produced and so on? So a, a lot there to talk about if you want to talk about it. Who wants to go first? You go first, Will. Okay, so I think, I think, <laughs> I think that um, one of the one one of the points that 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 was being made early there about um, that potential disconnect um, goes back to that point I think I made earlier about the relationship with the diaspora. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there is a tendency sometimes to feel that, um, particularly some of the films that are getting you know, from within the filmmaking community in Morocco, that some of the films that are getting visibility at international festivals that are able to attract festival funding or money from Doha are films that actually circulate in a, in a different kind of context and in a different world almost of sort of the, of the international festival circuit. These are auteur-led productions um, and films that are, um, you know, in some way disconnected. Um, I think there can be an element of truth in that, but I also think Fauzi Ben Said is, and, and Hicham Lassri are examples of filmmakers whose films travel well, but who I think also are very much kind of, they have a, what I would call a rooted transnationalism. You know, they're very much connected in terms of themes, language, approach, and sort of, a, um, these, these are not sort of, um, you know, diasporic filmmakers who who are sort of you know who, who haven't been back to, to to Morocco for for like 20 years or something there's, there's very much a kind of connection there so I think I think there's an element of truth within that um, but it speaks also to a bigger issue about how and Jamal has written about this before talking about Moroccan cinema as a divided house okay so how do you bridge that gap between the filmmakers who are resolutely local, who will look for funds only within a kind of national context, either from the CCM, from private investors who are few, or to, from, from TV. Um, how do you kind of bridge that gap in terms of getting them to maybe collaborate creatively with, with those filmmakers who are moving more circulating internationally, the kind of filmmakers I talk about as cinéaste de passage, but also how do we kind of how, how do those films that, that see themselves as resolutely national, but may have a potential to reach an international audience, how do those filmmakers actually have a sense that there is someone they can trust and there's a network that they actually understand to reach that international audience? So there are kind of, there, it's, I think there's, there's an element of truth in that. And Shimon, you know, I know you've, you've yeah. we've talked about I that. I guess before. that's a question that, uh, but, I mean, the film that you recommended earlier, Volubilis, by Faisal Ben Saeed, was trying to, I mean, to really to solve. Like, how do you make a film that is of very high quality, attracts, you know, festival attention, so it goes on festival uh, circuits and circulates internationally, <clears throat> at the same time gets uh, enough interest and enough audience, I mean, attention, I mean, in Morocco. So I guess the, the problem is still there. It has not been really, I mean, resolved. So they like, Moroccan cinema is, remains like a divided house. So there are movies that are made for like uh, for a national audience, and these films are very rarely, you know, I mean, very rarely attract the attention of festival organizers, not just abroad but also in Morocco, because they are seen as like popular cinema, cinema that is commercial and made like for uh, for film goers, rather than cinema that is made to be appreciated for its aesthetic, you know, kind of value. But I um, mean, the problem is that CCM, like the, the, the I mean. The, the enabler of Moroccan cinema in terms of funding, really encouraged that policy from the early 2000s. So they said that, you know, filmmakers are going to get funding, like especially a second time, if their previous movies like had attracted festival attention, so had been to good festivals abroad, or had really done well, you know, at the box office, I mean, in Morocco. So, and then they, they, they are still like, I mean, following that kind of policy, like, we're going to give money to certain people because we know that their films do well at the box office at home. And then we're going to give money to these other guys, to this other tribe, because they uh, go to Cannes, they go to Berlin, they go, I mean, to these, uh, to these places. 
So that is a really, I mean, something that is also encouraged by the, by the National Film Council, but it needs, it's uh, really a divide that needs to be bridged in order to create more, more alternatives and more diversity in the field of, uh, of Moroccan cinema. Okay. So about, yeah, so about the, the political, uh, what was the, you know, the, the, how the politics affect film, I guess. Uh, there are uh, red lines in Morocco. You cannot um, talk against the monarchy. You cannot talk about Islam and you cannot question the, uh, in, it's called l'intégrité du territoire, meaning the, uh, the territorial borders, and that includes uh, Western Sahara. So that's something you're not supposed to mm, put in question. Also, um, more recently, um, when the um, Islamist, the, the Parti Justice et Développement, uh, the Islamist Party came into power, all of a sudden there was all that all that talk about doing art propre, clean art, which meant that you could not really have, um, well, sex, but sex is not necessarily something that would happen you know visibly uh, on, on 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 a moroccan screen anyway uh but but there are things that that every any suggestion uh would be um completely criticized to the point that in, in some point at some point uh, uh, we we have seen uh, we have met filmmakers who told us oh we were kind of happy because the minute the parliament would say "Ooh, this film is terribly unclean and shouldn't be shown then then that created a buzz and then everybody would of course rush to the cinema to see it so it was in fact a wonderful way of publicizing cinema in its paradoxical fashion so yes, uh, politics do have some weight. Which, and, which, yeah. I, yeah, which Could I just add one, one more thing in relation to what Jamal was saying and this kind of question of, of the competing, I suppose the, the competing priorities for the CCM. I think one other thing to add to that is inward investment, by which I mean yeah. Morocco as a production service location, which is highly lucrative, um, but which doesn't really benefit, um, you know, the creative development of, of many filmmakers. It, it, you know, it, it provides a sort of kind of source of, um, of, of you know, income and employment for, for certain filmmakers who, who become part of the crew um, or maybe as fixers or location scouts. But, but, you know, all of those kind of big American, European productions that are coming to shoot in Morocco for the facilities and, and the climate and that they're bringing all their heads of departments and their directors. And, and, and it's not really a kind of positive, um, creative exchange for, 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 for Moroccan filmmakers, but it is highly important to the film industry and highly lucrative. And so what you tend to find when Moroccan cinema is being promoted internationally at key international markets like the European film market in Berlin or the Marché International du Film in Cannes, that the Moroccan cinema stand that is there is sort of saying, come and shoot in Morocco, get your tax rebate, you know, and you know, the, the Moroccan filmmakers are not always promoted front and centre in, the, you know, but, and that's understandable because this is kind of the, you know, it's the film business, right? And there's that kind of tension between art and commerce, but it is also, that's another, I think, difficult tension that um, particularly the CCM as the, as the kind of national screen agency has trouble resolving. That is somebody just picked up on something that Florence uh, said that, you know, the moment that there's a, a governmental disapproval of something, obviously that increases box office returns. So somebody is uh, questioning that, do, can they get a license for release if it is, if it's not approved by the government? So what, if, what, at what point do they draw the line when something is not screened? Well, they do deliver uh, exploitation visas, so they can also not uh, deliver them. But you need to understand if the CCM has already invested money and co-produced the film, chances are, and followed it the whole way, chances are none of this will happen. It will get through, yeah. Yeah, so. So there is a question in, you know, several questions around censorship by the CCM. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and I think you have answered that, uh, you know, kind of uh, directly and indirectly. But there's another question in relation to the production and the growth of Amazigh cinema. 
Um, and can you read it in relation to the official recognition of Amazigh culture and identity in the Moroccan state over the last 20 years? Do you see that as kind of evolving uh, together? Um, and maybe um, a, 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 you know, a question going back to the transnational question. How, what effect do these transnational connections and uh, interventions and practices and so on, how do they affect the aesthetic and the kind of uh, the, the language or the visual, uh, you know, kind of uh, feeling uh, of uh, the films produced in Morocco? So two questions in one, as we are, you know, kind of running uh, close to time. Yeah. Jamal, I'm a Zir expert. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think in terms of Amazigh cinema, I mean, what's been happening over the last 20 years in terms of political, I mean, recognition of Tamazir as uh, an official language in the constitution of 2011. So now in Morocco, we have two official languages, so Arabic and Tamazir. Although Tamazir has not been like, uh, is still, I mean, really not implemented as an official language in terms of media in terms of teaching and so on. So in teaching, for example, it's not yet generalized. Okay, so they say that next year they are going really to generalize it. But uh, I guess in terms of filmmaking, it, for, for the first time in Moroccan history in 2007, National Film Festival, 2008, sorry, National Film Festival in Tangier invited an Amazigh filmmaker to come and screen his, uh, his film, so Mohamed Lamish, with his film Tilila. And then for his next film, so for that film that he screened at the National Film Festival, he didn't get any funding from CCN, but for his next film, he got funded, okay? And then more filmmakers like, I mean, Rabbin Amrawi, and then also uh, filmmakers who have made like Tala Hadid and others, I mean, they have received funding from like CCN, although there are complaints that there is still a lot of discrimination against Amazigh films, so every year there is only one film or so that gets funding and the other films are all in Darija. So there is still a lot of, I mean, way to go I mean, in that regard. Yeah, so I think that the recognition of the language, the recognition of the culture by the, by the, by the government has helped, you know, uh, uh, Amazon film filmmakers feel that they are like part of the, I mean, part of the of national cinema, but also that they are, I mean, welcome to make it, to follow these productions without worrying about being censored, about going to jail and so on and so forth. Yeah, but in terms of censorship, uh, I think I need to just add something that it all, it also, it depends of course on the political environment, but it also depends on the man or the woman, we haven't had a woman yet, at the top of the CCN. True. So for many years, like from 2003 to 2000, to 20, 2014, I guess, so there was a man at the top of the same, he died recently, unfortunately, so Mr. Nordin Sayel. He was an intellectual, but he was, was also very charismatic and knew people you know, in power and so on. And he used that power to protect filmmakers from censorship, from political parties in the government, or even like from the, I mean, the regime itself. So he was somebody who defended freedom of expression and allowed people like Hisham Masri to make movies talking about the king, talking about you know the, the Ministry of the Interior, talking about you know all sorts of taboos, and then so but then that changed. I mean the Islamists, I mean came to, I mean became the main party in the coalition in 2011, and of course they went after Nordin Sayel, and you know removed him from CCM finally in 2014, and put a man in his place uh, by the name of uh, Sarim Fasil Fihri, and then you know the number of like cases of censorship just has gone up, okay? Like even for sometimes for movies that receive, I mean, some funding from CCM. So Hisham Lasri, Nordin Ayush, I mean, have all complained about, you know, censorship of uh, their movies or sometimes of uh, one of the installments of funding that goes towards the production of their, I mean, of their movies. So yeah, sometimes <laughs> the goodwill of one person at the top of, like in a key position, but, but Jamal, do, I mean, without going into uh, Morocco, Moroccan stories, it, it seems to me that, you know, Sarim Fasifiri is sort of imposed upon by the minister above him, no? I mean, yeah. I can't quite 
fight yeah, against. Yeah, CSAM is under the Ministry of yeah. Communication, now the Minister of Culture. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, um, we, we seem to be running out of time, but there, was, uh, there were a few questions that maybe we could uh, um, kind of uh, talk to very, in a very brief way. So the question around you know, Moroccan cinema or Moroccan cinemas in the plural. Um, and then whether there is something that you could call Moroccan cinema, um, you know, in relate, is it part of Arab cinema? Is it African and so on? So all these questions, you know, sort of, you know, kind of uh, engage with, with, the, uh, with the importance of the topic. You know, the fact that you have um, a field of work that can be called, you know, a field of work around Moroccan, Moroccan cinema is really exciting. Uh, but these are very big questions, I guess, and we are really running out of time and really apologize for my internet, which just knocked me out uh, for a few minutes. Um, and apologize to the um, brilliant uh, questions coming from the audience. Uh, and Nargis is, is the brilliant person here who can put them in perhaps a document. <laughs> We could, yes, and Aki does usually. Yes, because you might like to actually have this, some of these really very interesting questions. Yeah, we'll copy and paste them for you. Yeah, Thank and we, you. And we can send back the list of... We'd you know, the, love the that. Yes, yes, please. There have been several questions saying, could you please uh, recommend your, your you know, half a dozen top things? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I also want them to watch them. I haven't kind of find them to students uh, to, to look at and, and discuss. But this has been such a fascinating talk, and I think the format was brilliant to have the three of you. Uh, it, it kind of flowed really well, uh, and, uh, you know, loads of issues and questions and uh, understandings of the marketing context. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us, and have a good evening, afternoon, whatever. Um, Thank you. Thank it's you. A, it's an absolute you. pleasure. Really lovely to have you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye, bye. And thanks to all the audience. Okay. Bye, all. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. See you. Bye.